Father, we are grateful for a time such as this. We ask that you be present in power and let your grace wash all over us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Teach us by your spirit and cause us to be more like you. We pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I've been talking about um, doing a teaching uh, series on Hebrews chapter 6. So we're going to start with that this morning. Um, we're going to start with that this morning and um, we'll read Hebrews chapter 6 verses 1 uh, through 12. Okay. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism, and of laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do, if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh often upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. For that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. For beloved, we're persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we speak thus. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed towards his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Praise God. Now, Paul is talking to um, God's chosen people. I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Uh, the Bible, the book is not clear as to who the authorship is in terms of uh, a name being mentioned. Oftentimes when Paul would write, Paul would say, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the church in Corinth, to the church in Galatia, to the church in Ephesus. So the, the authorship of those books are not in dispute. But in this particular book, he did not, um, the book does not say Paul wrote it. But if you know uh, Paul's writings, number one, and the way that he would speak to the people either to chastise or to encourage or to break down the truth of the word of God, the, 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 the secrets, if you like, to the, to the uh, new covenant, the new Testament, then it's very clear that Paul is the one who wrote this book. I believe he did. Um, I also believe that the reason why he didn't bother to mention his name was because he was writing to his own people. See, it would be funny if I came on the platform and I said, this is Pastor Mo speaking to you. Now listen to me. You all know that this is Pastor Mo and you all are here every morning to listen to me. So it doesn't make any sense for me to come and announce who I am and to ask you to listen to me. I believe that's why this book of Hebrews doesn't say it was written by Paul because it was writing to his people. For whatever that is worth, that's what I believe. Bible scholars say they don't know who wrote it. But the way he broke down uh, the Old Testament and, and the New Testament and married both and showed the reason for the existence of one and the more or less suspension of the other. Only Paul had that kind of revelatory knowledge from the Spirit of God. So Paul is writing and he says, let us leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ and let us go on to perfection. I've told you repeatedly that the word perfection means um, maturity. It doesn't mean being perfect as in being flawless or sinless or without fault. It just means being mature. 
So Paul is calling us to a place of maturity. I have labored over this fellowship since the uh, 20th of February when God started it. I have been faithful and I have been diligent uh, to study and to bring you a fresh word from the presence of God. Uh, there were a few times that we couldn't be together because of um, my travel and, and situations in, in a third world country, which some of you are familiar with. Um, but by and large, I've not missed any day for any reason whatsoever uh, that wasn't uh, justifiable. So Paul, I'm now calling you guys to a place of maturity. And I'm calling you guys to a place of responsibility. Some of you are no longer where you were when you started about a year ago. Some of you have gone on to maturity and some of you understand the responsibility of, of ministry and of, of touching the lives of, of people. I looked at uh, the, uh, the Bible study chat group. And I see that we're about 100 and last time I looked, we were like about 150, 58, 160 or something like that. It's to the point where I cannot reach out to everybody by myself alone. You guys need to come to a place where you understand that this is a fellowship group that God put together, distance notwithstanding. And you guys need to be able to reach out to one another and encourage one another and don't leave it just up to myself alone. For counseling, uh, for prayers and things like that, I am always available. I am still available for anything that you may need me for. But outside of our time together every morning, Monday through Friday, you need to make friends with one another and you need to reach out to one another and you need to encourage one another. And you, if you don't see someone in the call, you need to call them. Consistently, I don't think at any one given time we have been more than 20 or 25 on these calls. Yet on the chat group, we're like 160. So let's, let's begin to do what is required of us. If we are family, like you all say we are, I see the chat group. And if we care about one another, then we should reach out to one another. I haven't seen um, I haven't seen Ricky in a while. Okay, um, there's nothing wrong with you looking up his number and calling him. That we haven't seen you on the on the on the Zoom calls in a while. Reach out to your brother, reach out to your sister, and encourage one another to not be absent from these meetings. For me, it makes no difference whether it's one person or not. Yesterday, it was just one person who logged on. And we stayed on, on the Zoom call till 9.23 before we both logged off. And then we logged on to WhatsApp uh, video. And we fellowship for maybe another 40, 50 minutes, almost an hour. Okay, so whether it's one person that comes, whether it's 50 people, whether it's 2,000 people, I will teach the word of God the way I know to teach it. So let's leave childish stuff and let's move on to maturity. The first thing Paul talks about here, he says, not the laying again of the foundation of repentance from dead works. Repentance is a foundational thing. It's the first step towards being saved. All right. In Romans chapter 8, Sorry, Romans chapter 10. Paul is writing to the church in Romans, in, in Rome, but he makes us to understand what we do to get saved. All right, look at verse 8. He says, but what saith it? He's talking about the word of God. What does the word say to you? The word is near you, even in your mouth, in your heart. That is this word of faith that we preach. That if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay? Give me one second. Can you still hear me? Yes. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Pastor. These calls are just they're disturbing me. All right, guys, I'm back. 
Verse 10, for with the heart a man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the prayer for repentance that we pray in order for us to get born again or get saved. That's the foundation. Once we get saved, 1 Peter 2, uh, verse 2 says, Like newborn babies, desire the sincere milk of the word of God so that you can grow through it. Okay? So when, when we get saved, we now begin to listen to the word of God. We begin to read the word of God. We begin to study the word of God. In our best interest, we change our circle of friends. God is, there's no scripture in the Bible that says change your circle of friends after you're born again. But the Bible does say that um, evil, evil company corrupts good character. So in our best interest, we change our circle of friends so that we don't continue to be influenced by some of the stuff that they do. I had a, a young man in, in, our, in our fellowship group call me um, to talk to me and to tell me that he wants to get away from the people he grew up with in the neighborhood because all they do is smoke weed and, and get into all kinds of trouble. He used to hang out with them before. Not that he smoked weed, but he, he would hang out with them. They persuaded him one time to try it. He tried it. He didn't like it. So he doesn't do it anymore. But he wants to get away from them, but he, he doesn't know how to because he still lives at home with his parents. He's not old enough or he doesn't have the money to, to go get a place and, and stay in some place. See, he had the, 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 the good sense at his young age to call me to say, Pastor Mo, what do I need to do? I can't get away from these people. We live on the same street. We're all in the same neighborhood. We've all hung out together from when I was a younger lad, you know? And he, he had enough sense to know that he needed to change his circle of friends. So Paul is saying, let's not start building this basic foundation again, where we are still dealing with repentance and being sorry and doing stuff that we know we have no business doing, and then feeling sorry, or, or dropping out of the race altogether. Because sometimes people don't know how to deal with, with guilt and condemnation. They just altogether quit. Okay? And the devil is not stupid. I keep telling you that. He's been around forever. And he knows you. God says in Psalms 103, he says, I remember... I, I know your frame. I remember your dust. The devil says the same thing. I know your frame. I remember that you're dust. And I know exactly how to fashion the right temptation to get you. There's some things the devil can never tempt you with. Because he knows you will not fall for it. But he knows the areas of your weakness. And he will fashion the temptation to suit that weakness. Why? To get you to fall. This is why Paul is calling us away from childish things, away from the basic doctrines into more mature things. Guys, I've been a pastor since 19, 1980. Okay? I have never taught any group or church like I have taught this group. I took uh, almost eight months to teach the New Testament verse by verse. I taught the book of Proverbs verse by verse. I taught the book of Song of Solomon verse by verse. The book of Ecclesiastes verse by verse. I broke down the scripture. And then I've taught other things beside that. And it's time for you guys to step up and become mature and live, leave all the, the little, little sins that doth so easily beset. All right? I know it's tough. I know it is tough. I see the world. I have the, the, the advantage of uh, 2020 hindsight. Okay? 
I know what the world was like when I was growing up as a teenager. We did not face a tenth of the pressure that your generation faces. But the same God who delivered us from what we faced that was compared to what our parents faced, it was like, this, this is the absolute end. And I promise you what you guys are facing now, by the time you, are, you all have kids, what your children will be facing, will, yours will be like child's play compared to theirs. Because God already said it in the book of Genesis that it, 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 he destroyed the first uh, creation or the second creation, I should say, the Adamic creation, because the heart of man was continually wicked. That's why he sent the flood. See? So by the time you guys have kids and your kids be become teenagers, what you're going through will be child's play. And the only place to hide is in the word of God. That's where your defense is. That's where your strength is. That's where your power is. This is why I encourage you to read the word of God. Read it, speak it, hear it, meditate on it. I've told you the eight things that we do with the word of God. It's in the chat group. Scroll back up and look at it. All right? Paul says, let us get away from these basic principles. All right? Like the laying again of the foundation of repentance from dead works. Don't cater to the flesh because the flesh is dead. It's decaying. And in Galatians 5, we read what the works of the flesh are. Okay? The Bible lists these things for us so that we know. I've taught you about gates to your soul, eye gates to your soul, what you watch. Once you see something, you can't unsee it. There are some websites that you have no business visiting. There are places that you have no business going to. There are people that you have no business sitting down to, to hang out with. Guys, if I stand on this table and you're standing beside me on the floor, which is easier for me to pull you up to the table or for you to pull me down to the ground where you're standing? Of course, it's easier for you to pull me down than it is for me to pull you up. So don't tell me um, I, I care about this person. That's why I, I, I hope to be able to share the word of God with them. You will be taking down your pants and removing your shirt and taking off your bra before you know what's happening. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That's the reason why I still see him. That's the reason why I still see her. I just want them to be saved. No, you're not Jesus. And you're not the Holy Ghost. It's not your job to save anybody. You owe them a prayer because you've seen the light. Lord, touch X, Y, Z. Let them come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ like I have found grace in your sight. That's all you owe them. And you don't have to see them or be with them to pray that prayer. Okay? Paul says, get away from these basic things. Repentance from dead works. There are places I won't go to. Not because I don't have the liberty to do so. Paul says all things are lawful. But not all things are expedient. Okay? Laying on again the foundation of repentance from dead works. How many times are you going to say, Lord, I'm sorry? And then you go back and you do the same thing. And then you come back and you say, Lord, I'm sorry. And you go back and you do the same. How long are you going to go through that motion? It's not worth it at the end of the day. I told you God told me something many years ago. Very simple il illustration, but powerful. And it has stayed with me. He said, your heart is like a waffle. And every time you listen to the devil, he captures one square. You listen to him, he captures another square. You listen to him, he captures another square. You listen to me one time, I take one square. So whoever you listen to the most and you do what it is that they're asking you to do, that's the person that's going to capture the most squares. 
And whoever controls your heart is the person that's going to control your behavior. The sound in my car is too long for my car. I mean, please look upstairs. I'm sorry, guys. It's too long to be in my car. All right? So whoever you listen to the most and whoever captures uh, your, your heart is the person that's going to control your heart. Okay? Paul says repentance from dead works. We need to get away from it. We need to begin to live the life that God has called us to live. We need to be, begin to become examples of believers. People need to see you and see the change in your life. Some of you were saved before you came to this platform. Some of you got saved here. All right? But it's time to move on to perfection, maturity. It goes on to say um, faith toward God. Faith is a basic. All right? Hebrews 11.6. The Bible says, I want to quote it properly. The Bible says in Hebrews 11.6, that but without faith it is impossible to please him being god without faith it is impossible to please god for he who comes to god must believe that god exists and that he's a rewarder of them who diligently seek him someone once asked me about uh how to stop their faith from wavering and i explained to them your faith doesn't waver Faith is a spiritual gift. It doesn't waver. If God has given you something, he's given it to you. It's not going to diminish. It's not going to increase. It's not going to waver. It's not going to shake. No. What happens is you allow doubt into your heart. And doubt makes you um, double-minded. And then you think your faith is wavering. Your faith is not wavering. Your faith is constant. It's a gift that God has given to you. You just need to activate it. But when you set your eyes on what you shouldn't set your eyes on, and you hear what you shouldn't hear, and you read what you shouldn't read, and you hang out with the people you shouldn't hang out with, it begins to create an atmosphere where you can doubt the veracity of the word of God. And so then, the devil makes you think your faith is wavering. Whereas your faith has been constant, hasn't gone anywhere. The gifts and the callings of God, they're without repentance. That's the scripture, look for it. God doesn't give you something today and then tomorrow changes his mind and be like, you know what, I really didn't want to give it. When we looked at the spiritual gifts from God the Father, Romans chapter 12, verse 3 to 8, gifts from God the Son, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 11, gifts from God the, uh, God the Spirit, Gifts from God the Son, Ephesians, uh, I want to say chapter 4, verses uh, 11 through, through 13 or something like that, right? When we looked at those gifts, we saw that each one of them gave faith. God the Father gave the gift of faith. God the Holy Ghost gave the gift of faith. Now, God the Son gave five gifts, the evangelist, the teacher, the pastor, the apostle, and the prophet. But the evangelist needs faith. To do the work of an evangelist. When you've told people Jesus can save and Jesus can heal and Jesus can do that. And somebody challenges you and says, all right, I'm blind. I want to see. You better have the faith of God to lay hands on that person. So that the person's eyes will be opened by the power of Almighty God. See? Faith is basic and it's there. It's a gift that God has given you. It doesn't go anywhere and it doesn't diminish. When you don't feed it. It's like a spiritual muscle. When you don't exercise it, when you don't feed it, then it doesn't work for you the way it's designed to work for you. But the more you submit yourself to the word of God and the more you take in the word of God and the more you apply the word of God to situations in your life and you see results, you become bolder and you become stronger in your faith, so to say. It's not that it was weak. It's not weak. It's a gift that the Father has given you're the one that's not strengthening it. You're the one that's not exercising it. You're the one that's not using it to the point where you can actually see it work for you. 
Praise God. The third thing Paul mentions, he talks about the doctrine of baptisms. The doctrine of baptisms. And there are three types of baptisms that are mentioned in scriptures. The first one is the baptism of suffering. Thank God we don't have to go through that. Only one person did, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Okay, that's the first kind of baptism, the baptism of suffering. The second kind of baptism that's mentioned in the, in the Bible is the baptism of repentance, which is the same thing as baptism with water. Now, there are all kinds of teachings out there concerning baptism, and there are all kinds of different ways that people practice it. But the biblical way is by immersion. The word baptism is a Greek word, baptizo, which means to immerse. So baptism is immersion in water. And what baptism says, first of all, let's look at Acts 19. I want you to, to see uh, some scriptures concerning it. The book of Acts chapter 19. Paul was coming from uh, 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 Ephesus and he encountered some disciples and he engaged them in a discussion. All right. Verse 19, uh, uh, chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said unto him, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. All right, so that is baptism by water. That's what John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, came to do. He was baptizing in Jordan, and people came by the droves to be baptized. It's a baptism of repentance. So when you repent of your sins and you invite Jesus Christ to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior, the next step in your walk of faith is baptism by water. Now, last year, we had a whole bunch of you flying to Houston to be baptized. And I thank God for the privilege of, of, of doing that with you and sharing in that joy and, and in that grace with you. But then I decided that that would be too expensive for each of you to come down to Houston uh, because you, you wanted me in particular to baptize you. It's not that any man or, or woman of God cannot baptize you. It was an act of your will and choice to come to Houston for me to be the one to baptize you. It's not compulsory that I baptize you as long as you are sure of the person that you're submitting yourself to for baptism. So I, I decided and I said to, to the group at that time that I will fly out it's cheaper for me to buy just a one ticket than for all you all to take money out of your pockets. I know it's coming from individual pockets, but if you put it all together, it's in several thousands of, of dollars. It's cheaper for me to buy the one ticket if you guys can put yourself together as one group. <clears throat> and on the 5th of November, 5th through the 7th of November, I actually flew to Miami and I had the privilege of baptizing several of you in this uh, Bible fellowship. So if you want to be baptized, get a group together. I will fly out to you. If you want me to, to be the one to baptize you, I will fly out to you and I will do it. It's an honor. But back to what we're saying, um, after you get born again, after you've prayed the prayer in Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 13, confessing with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, God assures you that you'll be saved. When you've done that, the next thing is to then be baptized with water. Even Jesus Christ, the son of almighty God, when he walked on this earth as a man, received baptism in water. He went to John the Baptist and asked for John to baptize him. And John was like, I the rather should kneel for you to baptize me. And Jesus said, let's fulfill all righteousness. Let's, let's do things the way it ought to be done. And he submitted himself to be baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. And the Bible records that after he was baptized, the heavens opened and God audibly validated his calling. 
and his work as, as, as the savior of the world and as the son of God. So your next step is water baptism. So if you're in this fellowship and you've not been baptized by immersion in water, you ought to get baptized. Some churches do baptism by sprinkling. They sprinkle you with water. They put it on your forehead. That's not baptizo. That's not immersion. That's man's way of interpreting scriptures. All right? Some of you were baptized as infants. That's unscriptural. You don't baptize inf infants. They, they, they have no knowledge of what you're doing. They have no understanding of what you're doing. And so it makes no meaning to them. The actual meaning of water baptism is when you are immersed in the water, you're saying to the world, I identify with the death and the burial of Jesus. When you're pulled out of the water, you're saying, I identify with his glorious resurrection from the dead. That's the message you're telling the world, that I identify with Christ. It's a public, it's a public demonstration of an inward work of grace. Okay? And then from that point on, you try by the leading of the Holy Spirit, the study and the application of the word of God to live a life that is worthy of your calling as a son of God. You're baptized as an infant. Your parents uh, pick their best friend or, or their, their closest sibling or whatever to be your godmother and your godfather. Question, when was the last time you saw a godfather or a godmother? What contribution have they made in your spiritual walk? In your life what have they taught you from the word of god what have you seen in their lives that is worthy of emulation so that's man's idea that's not god there's nothing like a godfather or a godmother you have fathers in the lord you have uh, sisters in the lord you have brothers in the lord okay so baptism is for adults who have given their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ and who wants to publicly, who want to publicly profess it. That's what baptism is. That's the second kind of baptism. First one is the baptism of suffering that only Jesus Christ went through for our sakes. All right. The second kind is the baptism by water. It's the same thing as the baptism of repentance. And it is by immersion by an adult who knows and understands what it understands what it is that they are doing and who want to live a public life declaring Christ to be their Lord and their Savior. The third kind of baptism the Bible mentions is the baptism in the Holy Ghost, baptism in the Holy Spirit. And there's a whole bunch of you who don't even know that it exists, like those guys in Acts chapter 19. Paul said in 19.2, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard, whether there is an, any Holy Ghost. So when you don't even know that there's a third person of the Godhead called the Holy Spirit, when you don't know him, you may have heard of him, you may have read of him, but you don't know him. You don't have a personal relationship with him. He does not speak to you. You don't speak to him. How then can you be baptized in it? Something you are not privy to, you cannot take advantage of. So it behoves you as a child of God to find out what it is when the Bible talks about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ said to his disciples just before he left, he said, wait in Jerusalem for the gift of the Father, the gift of the Holy Spirit. John chapters 14, 15, 16, and part of 17 talk about the Holy Spirit and what he's supposed to do in the life of a believer. I don't know if I should reteach that class because I've taught it before so that some of you who were not with us at that time can get to know the Holy Spirit for who he is. All right? If you would like for me to, to reteach re it, just put seven on the chat group so that I'll, I'll see it. If I have enough of you who want to know it, I will reteach it. Otherwise, you can call me one-on-one -on -one and I'll spend time to explain it to you. But Jesus Christ told them to wait in Jerusalem for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in the book of Acts, come to chapter 2. In obedience to Jesus asking them to wait, the Bible says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, Acts chapter 2 verse 1, 
They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. All right? That's what the Bible refers to as baptism in the Holy Spirit. Come with me quickly to Acts chapter 11. I want to show you several examples. Acts 11, we read of the account of Peter. All right? Peter was uh, awakened by God. Let me, let me give you the verse. Uh, let's read from verse 2, chapter 11. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised, and didst eat with them. Is this the one I'm looking for? Yes, it is. All right, there, there, are, actually two, um, there are actually two scriptures. There's one about Cornelius, and there's this other one. But let's continue reading this one. Then Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning, verse 4, and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Joppa, praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. A sudden vessel descend as it had been a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which, when I had fastened mine eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay, and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, that call thou not common. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. And behold, immediately there were three men already come unto me, come unto the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied, accompanied me and were entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, who is surnamed Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy household shall be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Paul referred to Jesus' words in John chapter 14, verse 26, where Jesus said, you guys are going to, uh, John baptized with water, but many, not many days from now, you will be baptized of the Holy Ghost. This is the result of what happened in chapter 10. That's the one we should have um, read first. Um, the account of Cornelius is what I'm looking for. It's chapter 10. Let's read verses 1 to... Eight, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. Praise God. So that's what happened before we read chapter 11. Cornelius saw this vision and an angel said to him, send for Peter. Now Peter being a Jew with all the laws and all the restrictions of what they could eat and what they could, couldn't eat. I told you the, the law in the Old Testament is more than 600 laws. 
it was just the church that brought out the 10 that you're familiar with. And we learned the 10 and memorized the 10, you know, thou shall have no other gods before me, thou shall not steal, thou shall not kill, thou shall not commit adultery. There's 10 of them that we memorized as kids. But the laws are actually 600 and something. There's one that says you can't wear garment of mixed, of mixed, uh, you can't wear a fabric that's made with two different kinds of wool. So if you wore something that was cotton and polyester, it was the same. You couldn't eat any animal with split hooves. So those of you who eat sausage and bacon, if you do, it's a sin. That's the law. That's why God suspended it and introduced the new covenant. All right? But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So there is a third kind of baptism that's called the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And it is evidenced by you speaking in tongues. That's what we saw in Acts chapter 2. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he will give you the ability and you will speak in other tongues. And I've taught about the power that's evident in that. Because when you pray in tongues, having been baptized of the Holy Spirit, you pray in a language that no one understands. The devil does not understand it. All his demons do not understand it. Even you that is praying the prayer in tongues don't understand it. What does that mean to the believer? It means I can pray in a language that only my father hears. And if it's only God that hears that prayer, then it means the devil cannot do anything about what I'm talking to my father about. Amen. So back in Hebrews chapter 6, which is our main text, those are the three kinds of baptisms in the Bible. And Paul says we should be done with that. So if you're in this study group and you're not baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, you're shortchanging yourself because the power that is in it is out of this world, literally. Praise God. Then he mentions the fourth one, laying on of hands. Paul is not saying we should suspend it. He says, let's move on from it. Let's, let's, let's come to a full understanding of how these things work and let it be done. Let's be done with it. Not that we won't practice it because we still lay hands on the sick. All right. But Paul is saying those are just the rudimentary stuff. Let's move on to more mature things. Praise God. The laying on of hands is one of the doctrines of the church. And there, there's a reason why we lay hands. Jesus Christ is the one who commanded it. Come with me to the book of Mark. Mark. The last chapter, which is chapter 16. And let's read what the scriptures say. Jesus talking to his disciples just before his, his departure and his ascension to heaven. He said to them, Mark 16, uh, let's read from verse 15. He says, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Verse 17. And these signs shall follow apostles. No. And these signs shall follow prophets. No. And these signs shall follow pastors only. No. And these signs shall follow those that have been born again for years and know those scriptures in and out. No. These signs shall follow them that believe. The only criteria God requires from you is that you believe. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. These signs shall accompany them that believe. So if you're a believer, this is what should accompany and attest to the fact that you're a believer. Now, have we mastered these things? No. But we keep pressing into it and we keep studying and we keep praying and we keep trusting and we keep believing and we keep making ourselves vessels unto honor that the Father will deem fit to use. Laying on of hands is a basic doctrine of the Christian faith because that is how you transfer the grace that's upon one life to another. 
So if God has gifted me with healing, I lay hands on the sick and I fully expect them to recover. I do it. It's not my place to heal. I'm not God. I'm not a healer. But he said I should lay hands and he will heal the sick. James chapter 5. Okay? So it is a basic doctrine of the Christian faith to lay hands. We lay hands on people to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But there are examples in the scriptures which we just read where even without the laying on of hands, the Holy Spirit sovereignly falls on people. He can fall on you in the bathtub. He can fall on you in the bathroom. He can fall on you uh, in your bedroom. He can fall on you while, while you're driving your car. He's God. He's sovereign. He can do what he wants to do. Amen. So the first one is the foundation of repentance from dead works. Second, faith. Third, the doctrines of baptism. Fourth, the laying on of hands. And then he goes on to talk about the resurrection of the dead. And there is a resurrection of the dead, whether you believe it or not. All right? Because we have a firstborn from the dead who is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says he died and on the third day he rose. It is a historical fact. Over 500 souls were raised from the dead the morning he got out of the grave and they returned to their families. He was seen of many after his resurrection. Let me share a personal testimony with you guys. My mother died on the 9th of December, 2011. The pain is indescribable. There are no words for it. I've lost people. I lost a sister. I lost my dad. I lost my grandparents. I've, I've lost cousins, aunts. It's nothing compared to the loss of a mother. I was, I was damaged. I couldn't function. I couldn't think. I couldn't eat. I couldn't do anything. There was a huge knot in my heart. On the 17th of February, 2012, God touched my heart and he healed me. And I literally felt that knot dissolve. That's when the pain of the loss stopped. The physical pain of the loss stopped. Okay? But the pain is still there because once you lose a mom, it's forever. It, it never heals. All right? Now, I said all of this to share this testimony with you. I went into her room. I, I, was, I did it often. I would just stand there. Sometimes I would cry. Sometimes I would just stand there in, in total shock and disbelief that she was gone. And I heard a clanging sound behind me. I turned and I looked. Um, we had this uh, vertical blinds in her room. You know, the kind that you, you yeah, the vertical blinds. You can, you can pull a string and they go up or while they're down, you can turn a rod and you can either shut it or open it. I'm sure you know what I'm describing. So I turned around and I recognized that the clang came from that blind. Now guys, I understand an up and down movement because of gravity. But where there is no wind, I don't understand a sideways movement of objects. The blinds had lifted off the wall and hit the wall. So I looked at it and I'm like, what just happened? I went out of, my out of her room into my room because we had an adjoining door. She was living with me at that time out of my room and I ran into the kitchen to go, out, to go see if it was a windy night. It wasn't windy. I came back into the room and I was looking at the blinds. I couldn't understand the sound that I had heard and what I knew obviously caused it. It lifted off of the wall and hit the wall. So I went into the uh, living room and I started to pray. And I said, Lord, 
I live alone. I'm not about to be spooked out of my home. I, 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 I don't understand what just happened in my mother's room. If, there, if there's any presence or whatever that's in this, in my house, we need to deal with it now. And those, whatever spirits or whatever it is, needs to be gone. And while I was praying, because it became like a warfare kind of praying, while I was praying, I quoted Hebrews 9.27 that said it is appointed for man to die once and after that, the judgment. And the moment I quoted that scripture while praying, God said to me, child, where in that scripture did I tell you that they cannot come back? So I went back to the scriptures. I looked at it. It is appointed for man to die once and after that, the judgment. So I kept quiet and I kept listening because I knew the Lord was speaking. And then the Lord said to me again, he said, when my son rose from the dead, didn't I allow him to still make an appearance in the realm of the physical? I couldn't argue because I knew the scripture said so. I said, yes, Lord. Then he took me to the Old Testament and he said, when Saul, the king of Israel, went and uh, consulted a witch, the witch of Endor, because the spirit of the Lord had departed from him. I don't want to go into that. He had messed up and the spirit of the Lord had departed from him. And God had chosen another king, David. So Paul could no longer, uh, I mean, Saul, King Saul could no longer hear from God, could no longer hear from the spirit of God and didn't have directions. And Samuel, the prophet, wasn't dealing with him anymore because he had offended God. So he decided to consult with a witch in a town called Endor to give him directions as to how to continue to be a king. And so this witch would do some hocus pocus and would conjure the image of Samuel, the prophet, who had since died. And they would give Saul this false uh, leading and false direction and false stuff that Samuel didn't say because it wasn't Samuel that was coming up. So on one occasion, when Saul went to consult this witch, God now allowed the real spirit of Samuel, the prophet, to show up. And Samuel said, why are you bothering me? So God allowed Samuel to actually reappear in the realm of the physical, even though he had died and was waiting in paradise for Jesus' death and resurrection to take all of them that were in paradise to heaven. See, so it is possible. This is what I'm saying. I don't even know how I digress into that. that we're talking about the resurrection of the dead. There are six kinds of resurrection of the dead that is mentioned. And I want to take the time to teach that as a topic by itself. Okay? So I'm going to suspend that. Maybe that's what I'm going to teach tomorrow so that you understand how, what the six different uh, resurrection types are in scriptures because if i go into it will take too much time with it but let's suspend that till tomorrow morning when i will teach on the various kinds of resurrection the bible talks about but it's real and it's going to happen and that's the blessed hope that we have before i leave and i know i'm going to touch on it again tomorrow when i teach on resurrection come to first corinthians chapter 15 let me just show you real quick <clears throat> first corinthians chapter 15 and we're going to read Verse 51. Are you there? Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. We shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorrupt, incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the, the Lord. We will be resurrected, those of us who die before Jesus appears in the skies. 
The Bible says those of us who are dead will be resurrected. Those of us who are alive will come together to meet him in the air and he will take us to heaven. And the Bible says, so we will be with him forever. All right? We'll teach on resurrection in full tomorrow so that you understand the blessed hope that we have as believers. All right? And then he talks about eternal judgment. And there are two major judgments which I will also teach on because I need for you to understand both. So tomorrow I'll teach on the various resurrections that are mentioned in scriptures. Then on, on today's Tuesday, then on Thursday, I will teach on the two judgments that you need to know. Very important. The second judgment is very critical and that's the one you don't want to be in. Praise God. I'm going to wrap it up and I'm going to take questions at this time. Does anyone have any questions? Anything that I said that you're not clear on? Oh, y'all muted. <laughs> I'm sorry. This one right. recorded, right? Pardon? This was recorded, right? Yes, it is recorded. Okay. Anyone have any questions? All right, if you don't, let's pray. We're going to wrap it up. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the power that's in it. Thank you for bringing to our remembrance the things that we ought to know and the way we ought to be walking. Ah, come on. 86 we, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Back in. Oh, yeah? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we ask that those of us who are pressing into you and who are diligently seeking you, that you will reward us and you will make our reward visible that men may know that it is profitable to seek after you and to follow after you. Touch our hearts and let your word find room to grow, to change us, to equip us, and to fulfill our deepest desires, which is to know you more. We give you thanks and praise. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you all. I'll see you all tomorrow. We're going to look at the different resurrections the Bible talks about. And then the day after, we're going to look at the judgments, the two judgments that the Bible talks about.